Good morning, Hope Fellowship family. Grace and peace be to you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And all God's people said, Amen. This morning, as we continue our sermon series in the book of Acts that we are calling Gathered and Scattered, we're going to study the conversion experience of one of the most influential people in history. So if you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 9, starting in verse 1. Hear these, for these are the very words of God. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found anyone there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but they did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. And for three days he was blind, and he did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus, there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias. Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask him for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision, he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm that he has done to your saints in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priest to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said to Ananias, Go, this man must be my chosen instrument to carry my name before the Gentiles and their kings and before the people of Israel. And I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. And placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother, Brother Saul, the Lord, the Lord Jesus who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, he sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. And immediately something like scales fell from Saul's eyes and he could see again. He got up and was baptized. And after taking some food, he regained his strength. And brothers and sisters, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So let's dive in. Verse 1. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the disciples. Now let's pause here for a moment and do a brief overview of how this story of Jesus is unfolding throughout the book of Acts. Again, you might remember that in Acts chapter 2, the Spirit descended on Pentecost and gave birth to the early church. And this early church caught fire shortly thereafter uh, through preaching that led to conversion. Thousands were added with each sermon. And And these early believers, these people, were forming communities. They were forming contrast communities that were compelling to all people. In fact, they uh, experienced a brief moment where they, uh, where, they experience, where they experienced favor with all people. But as we moved through Acts, we saw that that honeymoon did not last much longer. Just two chapters later, uh, there was starting to become uh, some persecution. Persecution started to break out against the church. The Sanhedrin, the, the ruling council of the Jewish faith, was starting to breathe down the necks of the leadership. And soon, uh, that concern turned into violence just a few chapters later with the stoning of Stephen, one of the early deacons, one of the first deacons in the early church. And we're told after the stoning of Stephen that that the believers in Jerusalem were scattered. But we're also told that that those who were scattered preached the gospel wherever they went. 
that that scattering that was meant to kill the church actually caused the church to spread more quickly. You might remember I used the image of that dandelion when it becomes white with seeds and someone blows it and it just kind of, it just sends those seeds across the lawn. That's what happened with the early church. But with the scattering, the persecution did not end because we meet the main villain in this unfolding drama, Saul. He later is known and probably better known as Paul, but we'll get to that in a couple of weeks but we meet the main villain in the story. And we actually met Saul before chapter 9. In chapter 7, in the stoning of Stephen, Paul is this shadowy figure uh, in the corner. But he plays an important role in that event. Here is what we're told in Acts chapter 7. It says this, The witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. And Saul approved of their killing him. In the ancient Near East, laying your coat at someone's feet was a sign of respect, as a sign of you uh, recognizing their authority over your life. And so, uh, so Saul is playing this primary role over the execution of Stephen. So why did he have so much power? Saul was on the fast track. He was a star pupil of the influential rabbi Gamaliel. And in Philippians 3, he gives his spiritual resume. Here's what uh, Paul, Paul in Philippians, what Saul now says in Philippians 3. He says, look, I was circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews, in regards to the law of Pharisee, as for zeal, persecuting the church, and as for legalistic righteousness, faultless. See, Saul played by the letter of the law perfectly. But yet, there was this undercurrent of anger and resentment in his life that led to a lack of love and charity. Here in chapter 9, we're told that he was breathing out murderous threats against the church. And that word breathing out is uh, usually used, that Greek word that we translate breathing out was usually reserved to describe wild animals going after prey. So this idea is that Saul is this ferocious lion and his prey was Christians. What caused this rage? What caused this man who was an expert in the law, an expert in scripture, to have such rotten fruit bear out in his life. Well, here's what happened. Saul anointed himself as the defender of his version of the truth. He spent his entire life building that spiritual resume. And by doing so, he built his entire life on works rather than grace. And now there's this group of people saying, "Uh, you're wrong, Saul. It's not about any of that. God has something much more beautiful in store for his people. And his religious categories were being challenged. And he couldn't handle it. And he raged. If I'm honest, I have more Saul in me than I would like to admit. In fact, I think most of us do. Because how much time do we spend building our spiritual resumes? How much easier is it to build our lives on works rather than grace? Because works are easy. Works are straightforward. If you know the right answers, if you believe the right things, if you look the part, then you can carve out a pretty decent life for yourself. But like Saul, this kind of life lacks love. And it lacks charity. And it can lead to anger. And it can lead to a raging heart, even if we're pretty good at hiding it. Because you see this all the time. When our religious categories are challenged, we rage. You know, as a pastor for 11 years, I've seen this play out around one thing in particular. And that's when you preach grace. 
Now, I know that might sound absurd because uh, in the Reformed tradition, we hold that doctrine of grace as one of our primary beliefs. And it's one of the reasons that drew me uh, to this tradition in the first place. But when you actually start preaching it, when you actually start talking about the implications of radical grace in our lives and in our church and in our world, there's a raging that starts to happen. Uh, because here's what will often, here's often the case, is that when grace is for us, when forgiveness is for us, we like it. <laughs> because we think for some reason we've, we've earned it. That we know that we're a good, I know I'm a good person, and so if I'm, uh, if grace is extended to me, if forgiveness is extended to me, I'm grateful for it, but I'm also, um, I feel slightly entitled to it, if I'm being quite honest. Grace is good for me. But when we talk about grace for other people, grace for people who are living ways that we don't agree with, or people that are doing things that we don't like, or people that are different than us, if we talk about extending grace to them, I often hear the yeah but. I get the yeah but email. I know, Pastor, you're talking about grace. Yeah, but. But here's the deal. With the gospel, there are no yeah buts. I know that's a profound statement for a Sunday morning, but I want you to sit with it for a moment. With grace, there are no yeah buts. Because this is what we build our life upon. Not works, not rules, not morality, not decisions. We base our life on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's been a while since I put this slide up, but I call uh, this the gospel basics. This isn't, of course, uh, the complete kind of beauty and mystery of the gospel. Of course, that would take me hours and the rest of my life to explain. But this is kind of the gospel on a cocktail napkin. Something you can memorize, something your kids can memorize, something to get kind of those basics down into our bones. One is that there's a problem. If there's ever a time we can look out into the world and look into our own hearts and say, yes, yeah, something's not right here, it would be right now. We look out into the world, we look into our own hearts, and something's not right. And that problem, the name that we give to that primary problem is sin. The sin that is in the world and the sin that is in every human heart. And despite our best efforts to do it, to solve that problem on our own, we are not the solution to our greatest problem. Jesus is. Through his life and death, his resurrection and his ascension, we are given new life. We are freed from the powers of our ultimate enemy, sin and death. And through the, uh, through the Holy Spirit, we are empowered now to live out of that new identity as forgiven and redeemed people. That is the gospel. And the gospel is good news for everyone. No yeah buts. So if you are far from God... The gospel is good news for you. That God, through unmerited favor, has welcomed you into the family. It's good news for you. But it's also good news for the Sauls of this world, for us recovering Pharisees. What the gospel says is you don't have to earn a thing. It's not works. It's grace. There are no yeah buts. It's good news for everyone. The great writer, commentator, theologian, John Stott said this. The grace of God so frees us from the bondage of our pride, prejudice, and self-centeredness as to enable us to repent and believe. One can but, uh, one can but magnify the grace of God that he should have had mercy on such a rabid bigot as Saul. That he had mercy. We sang that song earlier, what mercy did for me, Right? that he had mercy on such a rabid bigot as Saul, and indeed on such proud, rebellious, and wayward creatures as ourselves. Look what mercy did for us. This is the gospel, good news for everyone, and we build our life on this. Continuing in verse 3. As he neared Damascus, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him, he fell to the ground and the voice said, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? See, again, Saul was on the fast track. Saul was going somewhere. Saul had his notion of God. Saul had his categories. Saul had his spiritual resume. And Saul even had excuses for his murderous spirit. 
but here the light appears. And he saw the light. And here Saul meets the God of disruption. Here Saul meets the God of disruption. And Saul, probably for the first time in his entire life, did not have an answer. God is greater than Saul's training, his intellect, his ability, his power. God literally knocked Saul off of his high horse, and now big bad Saul is now on the ground like a turtle. And in verse 8, we're told that Saul was blind and weak, and they had to take him by the hand. Again, big bad Saul, the raging lion, had to be led by the hand like a child who's crossing the street for the first time. See, he meets the God of disruption. And this disruption, in this disruption, Saul finally met God. We all need a Damascus Road experience. And here's what I mean by this. This is often people in our tradition, the Reformed tradition, uh, get uneasy with, with Saul's conversion because a lot of us d- don't have a conversion story. Many of us who grew up um, in CRC churches were baptized as babies and they knew nothing but being brought up in the faith. I am different. I had a bit of a conversion experience right after high school and so we get uneasy about uh, this story, especially those longtime uh, church members. But we all need a Damascus Road experience. It might not be mirac- or it might not be dramatic like it was here with Saul, but the point of this conversion experience is not drama but disruption. Let me say this again. At the heart, the center of the Damascus Road story, the conversion of Saul, it's not drama, it's disruption. And so this question is what happens when God disrupts our life? What happens when God interrupts our plans? Because like Saul, we have our notions of God, we have our categories, we have our excuses, and then the light comes. What happens when God disrupts our lives? We must be open. We must be open to this disruption and what it can teach us. Now, I've been saying this to as many people that will listen. I've been preaching this to myself, don't resent the disruption. Don't resent the disruption. Be open to the God who graciously disrupts our lives. And this is so important right now because we're not just facing moments of disruption. We are facing a season of disruption. And we need to get our head around this. We need to continue to get our head around this. You know, I saw this meme floating around uh, Twitter, Facebook, uh, all the social media stuff. Um, And perhaps you've seen this or some iteration of this meme. And it basically says that uh, if you come out of this time, if you come out of quarantine without a new skill or a new side hustle or more knowledge, then you've, you know, you've wasted this time. Or it, it shows that you, it wasn't about time, it was about discipline. There's some kind of version of this and there's been many of them. And first of all, I'd like to say that that meme is uh, utter nonsense because it's perfectly okay that during a global pandemic, you didn't learn a new skill or take up a new hobby or read 30 uh, books during this time. It's okay. We're all just trying to survive. But I will tell you what would be a waste is if we wasted the opportunity for deep interior work if we came out of this time unchanged and if we came out of this time just bitter that it happened rather than to embrace the disruption. That would be a waste. If we came out of this time concerned about the same small things that we were concerned about before uh, before when when our lives were relatively comfortable, that would be a waste. That would be a waste of this disruption. It would be a waste of this disruption as a church if we continued to let kind of the small things that that usually dominate our discussions surrounding where we're going, if we allow those to be the same small discussions moving forward as they were in the past, that would be a waste of the disruption. So it's my prayer 
that we would not resent the disruption, but that we would learn in this time of disruption, just like Saul for those three days when he was blind and he couldn't see and he couldn't eat. He was doing deep interior work. We would do the same. That as we are a scattered church, we would be inspired by the power of the scattered church in Acts. And so that when we come and when we start to regather here in a couple weeks, that we would care about bigger, more important things, that we would focus on being a contrast community with a more compelling vision of the world so that people would come here like a moth to a flame, not worried about the small and petty things we would so often be consumed by. That would be wasting the disruption. We cannot waste the disruption. For in the disruption, God meets us and truly changes us. See, we all need a Damascus road experience. We need to meet the God of disruption and watch him change our life. Continuing on. So the Lord sends a reluctant disciple. So Saul's in his darkness. He's doing that interior work. And we're told that there is a disciple in Damascus named Ananias. And the Lord appears to Ananias and says, go. But Ananias' response wasn't exactly a glowing response. Look at what he says uh, in verse 13. Lord, I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done in Jerusalem. He has come here with authority to arrest all who call on your name. And so Ananias is talking to the Lord in this vision. And he says, go to Saul. Perhaps you haven't received the update, Lord about what this man is doing. And the Lord says, yeah, I know. You have to go anyway. And so what we see in this episode is that when Jesus, when he was uh, teaching before his death and resurrection, when he was pouring into his disciples, and he said, actually, love your enemy. When Jesus said, love your enemy, he actually meant it. Yes, love extends to the greatest villain in your story, Ananias. Love is extended to Saul. And so he goes, and in verse 17 we're told this, Ananias went to the house and placing his hands on Saul, said, brother. Brother Saul. The first words that Saul ever heard from a Christian was brother. Brother Saul. He was welcomed in. The man who killed and was uh, and imprisoning Christians, was welcomed in as a brother. This kind of love called, uh, caused the scales to fall from his eyes. This kind of love caused Saul to be baptized. This kind of love turned an enemy into a brother. And this is where I want to end. Through Saul we see the importance and the power of disruption. The great mercy of God is found in the disruption. But in Ananias, this reluctant disciple, what we see is the radical extent of love. That love is even extended to the greatest villain in your story. It's even for them. Yes, love is even for them. And why? Why is it available even for them? How can we love even them? It's because we were loved. Paul, or Saul, if you will, later wrote in Romans 5 that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. While we were still enemies with God, We were reconciled to God through the death of God's Son. While we were still Saul's, we were welcomed in as brothers and sisters. And this is the deep, deep love of God. And this love is still the most powerful force in this world. And this love is available to you, to me, to all the Saul's of the world. There are no yeah buts with the gospel. This love is available to you today and every day. So Hope Fellowship, may you take hold of the deep, deep love of Jesus. 
May you experience it. May you accept it. May you build your life upon it. And may this love calm the raging of your heart. And may you find every opportunity to extend this love to a hurting and broken world. And brothers and sisters, this is the gospel of our Lord. Amen and amen.